Hello there, welcome to your Tea Time edition of Snooker Live. We are live right here at the Crucible for the 2014 Daffabet World Snooker Championship. And it has been an afternoon for the Golden Oldies. It's not just been the debutants who've been upsetting the odds. Alan McManus, the Angles, 23 years after his Crucible debut, has knocked out the four-time world champion John Higgins. I'm joined to dissect that match and many other talking points by Matthew Selt. Matthew, before we talk about Alan and his great win, let's just uh, wrap things up around your season. It's sort of the second half of your year seemed to go a bit better than the first half. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, started off the year not very good. I, I lost uh, my first five or six matches, which is obviously not the way you want to start any season off. Um, played played uh, pretty poor, to be fair, and there, there's no excuses apart from the fact that I didn't put any much hard work in. Um, but luckily enough, I managed to finish a lot better than I started, which is a, is a huge relief rolling into next season. So, uh, yeah. Semi-finals in Poland as well. Not not a not a bad return. Yeah, no, yeah, no it was good. You know, that's obviously the furthest I've been in the PTC by a long shot, and uh, it was nice. A bit disappointed to lose to Sean because I felt I could have gone on and won the tournament. I was playing really good, which was surprising because before that tournament, I showed no form whatsoever. So. Um, Getting to the semis was obviously good and it set me up a good platform for the rest of the remaining tournaments. We almost uh, got to see him here, but uh, not quite. You won two qualifying rounds and then I think you were, were you about 6-3 up yeah, against yeah, White yeah. Lightning? And, yeah, and he, came back, he came back 10-7. I mean, he, he made a fantastic effort against Mark Selby, so he's a class act, but it was agonisingly close to, to get him back here to the Crucible. Yeah, disappointing. Obviously, playing here last year was, um, you know, it was the, probably the highlight of my career. Obviously, I, I got beat, but I felt like it was the most amazing thing I'd ever been through and a great experience. So, um, getting to the last qualifying round again, I showed, obviously, quite a lot of form. And uh, I, I felt, especially at 6-3, that I was going to not cruise to victory, but I felt I had a lot in the tank. And just unfortunately, I lost a couple of huge trains from 60-odd in front and Michael done well, to be fair, to come back and made a couple of good clearances to, to beat me. And, uh, you know, all credit to him. OK, well, you, you've got plenty to work on for uh, for the beginning of next season. I mentioned the, the Alan McManus uh, yeah. victory, the Golden Oldies. I mean, what is going on? You're quite a student of the game as well. We've got, you know, we've got Ken Doherty winning uh, against Stuart Bingham at the age of 44 and then Alan finishing off against John, despite the fact that John came back into that match towards the end. Disappointment there for the four-time world champion. But what an afternoon for Alan McManus. 10-7, and he's into the second round for the first time in nine years. Amazing. It's unbelievable. You know, when, you know people, um, people don't see Alan on the TV all the time. You know, they think he's dropped off the scene. He's not playing too good. But I, I'll tell you this, Alan's been playing great snooker for the last nine months. And, you know, he got here last year. And uh, it's no surprise to me that he's beating these players. I've seen a couple of tweets saying they don't know how Alan loses because obviously he doesn't make too many mistakes. Um, but, you know, he played very well against John. I thought he was very, very impressive. John obviously wasn't at his best. You know, he'd be the first to admit that. But Alan, don't take anything away from the way that he played. It was phenomenal. And, you know, the, you've got to remember Alan's a, a class player. You don't lose the class. You might lose your form. But he's been at the top of the game. He's won many tournaments, including the Masters. So he knows what he's doing and uh, he's capable of beating anyone. People talk about how this sport is a young man's game now with the amount of travelling involved, and yet that can't always be the case. Otherwise, you wouldn't have two players like Ken Doherty and Alan McManus meeting in the second round here at the <laughs> Crucible. So there's, there's, there's room for the older guys to, to, to bring their experience and their knowledge to the fore, as, as, well, as, the, as well as the young guns who are, who are trying to beat everybody up. Definitely. You know, it's all well and good being a spring chicken, being young and being able to travel the world and not, and not affect you, but, you know, it affects all of us. And... But the one thing they've got that a lot of players don't have is experience of, of winning matches and doing it on the big big time occasion. So there's no replacement for that. I don't care how young and fit you are. You know, they, they've got what it takes. Well, I'm sure there were uh, a lot of people who were uh, wishing Alan well, trying to send him uh, tweets and get in touch with him on his phone. But uh, we got in the queue and got a minute or two with him after the press conference when he was just so delighted to have beaten his best mate, John Higgins, to get through to face Ken. This is what he well, said. Well, the Tartan Trues have done a job for the Angles. And Alan, you must be delighted to register your first Crucible win in nine years. Yeah, it's been a long time. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to win any match here, especially against John. And I'm real thrilled about it, yeah. Hard to play someone you admire so much and, and someone you have such a good friendship with? Yeah, it, it, it kind of is, but... I think now that you're a bit older, or I'm certainly a bit older, that uh, 
there's more of a comfort feeling. I, I think anyway, it was just nice for me to share that time with John out there. That that kind of thing doesn't happen every day, and it was just a pleasure to play him. Yeah. And uh, it's a fascinating second round match in prospect. You and Big Ken both rolling back the years in style. The the forty the forty some things are, yeah. are still going strong. Well, we're having a go, and, and uh, Ken, I thought he was fantastic against Stuart Bingham. I think next game is going to be a real cracker with both of us. I think it could be a close one, but who knows? You know, um, I know Ken's playing well because to beat Bingham is a great result. He's one of the top players in the world now. So, um, you know, but roll on. What is it Saturday? And I'm sure we're going to have a good game. Yeah. And such a big prize awaiting yeah. one of the two of you as well. A, a World Championship quarter final berth. When you were, you know, when you were slogging it out earlier in the season, you you might have taken that. I possibly would have done, but you know, you, you, you do dream, I suppose, and uh, quarters of the world would be nice. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm old enough to know just go out and play my game and not worry about what, what round it is. I'll, I'll worry about that afterwards, you know. But uh, yeah, I mean, as I say, roll on uh, Saturday and let's get it on. Is it still as special 23 odd years after your debut? Do you still get the tingle when you're out there soaking up the. The atmosphere and the crowd. Massive shock. You touched on it just at the start of the programme. Michael Wosley coming back late last night and dispatching one of the key favourites, winner of five ranking event titles this year, Ding Zhongwei. You're on the circuit. You play with these guys all the time. How surprised were you by Michael's performance and his nerve on such a huge setting? Yeah, I mean, there's no way around it. It was probably uh, the biggest shock in Crucible history, I'd say. Uh, Possibly the biggest shock of the year with any 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 result. Um, but you know, as I said, I've said to a few people, Michael was six three down. Everyone expected Ding to win comfortably at the start, especially at six three up. And I said to Michael early, you know, a lot of people were going to say well done and congratulate you. But I said to him, you know, I watched it from six three, and to me, he looked like the better player from six three. And uh, it was a fantastic performance. You know, he uh, he didn't crawl over the line, he didn't fall over the line. He went out there and he beat the player of the season from 6-3 down in the first round at Sheffield. And uh, I'm sure if that don't win moment of the year at the Snooker Awards, then nothing will. It was, it was an outrageous performance and, you know, massive congratulations to the kid. Uh, and just put, it, uh, just put a Crucible debut into context for us. I mean, how would he have been feeling? What, what was it like for you the first time you came out? Because it's such a... It's such a venue uh, with a, you know, with a sense of history, with a sense of pressure. The TV cameras are there. The audience are on top of you. You're right next to your opponent. It must be, at times, incredibly intimidating as well as exhilarating. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to talk about myself too much because obviously I don't want to take away from what Michael done. He settled a lot quicker than I did. I struggled last year. I didn't know where I was for five frames, and and you know it was a. I always thought when I, when I got here I, I would be okay, but I wasn't. And for Michael to settle down like that, obviously he was 6-3 down, but he played good and, and, you know, he looked like he settled really quickly and he was enjoying it. And I think that that's the key. Uh, Ken touched on it. I listened to him in the commentary and uh, he said it's all about settling down and Michael looked like he got settled pretty, pretty quick and, you know, he looked like he played good from the off, to be fair. Do you put him down as potentially a favourite when he comes back out for the second round? He'll face either Dominic Dale or Mark Davis, who are the very last pair to get going in the first round. I don't think they start until tomorrow night. They've been hanging around for a long time. Dominic's been entertaining us with uh, opera lessons and all sorts of stuff that only he could do. But does Michael start that one as favourite, despite the fact that Dominic and Mark have a lot more experience? Uh, I wouldn't, I'm not too sure you can put him down as favourite, obviously. Uh... That was, a, that was a great performance. Um, I wouldn't say he'd be favourite, but you know, if he plays the way he did in that second half of that match, if he plays like that, he would definitely be no worse than 50-50 because, you know, as I said before, it was, it was a fantastic performance. And, you know, I don't think, I don't think one result would make you favourite against someone that's in the top 16 or previous tournament winners. But um, if he plays like he did, he's got every chance of winning, definitely. Right, a few more talking points to come, but I know there are many people out there who follow Twitter. Michael's uh, Twitter follower's name is, uh, he's at Michael Wosley. Now, he's out there for a nickname. The best we can come up with in the press room so far is the fact that he slayed the Chinese dragon. We've got the Gloucester Gladiator. So if you think you've got any better ideas, send Michael a tweet because he's put it out there. Listen, I'm in the second round of the Crucible. I've got to have a nickname. Dominic is obviously the spaceman. Michael wants and deserves a nickname. So if you've got any better ideas than the Gloucester Gladiator, which, by the way, we haven't run past him, send him, send him a tweet or send us a tweet. 
Uh, right, changing tack just for a moment. Big press conference planned tomorrow from, uh, from Barry Hearn. A lot to talk about. One of, the, one of the issues, of course, at the moment is, are they going to offer you know, a, a, a card to the likes of Steve Davis and Stephen Hendry? Where do you stand on this? Because there are a lot of different views. Steve sat in your seat last night and he said, look, I'm not going to Q school. I don't want to take a place away from someone else. But if something's offered that enables me to guest here and there, I'll probably take it. What do you think? Um, well, first of all, I think Steve's put in an awkward position when he's asked something like that. You know, it's obviously a tough question. But I, was, I think, of course, he'd like to still play as a professional in all the tournaments. Don't really want to go to Q school. How do I stand? I think, uh, you know, we was told at the start of last season there'll be no wild cards. So for me, there shouldn't be no wild cards, you know, because we can't be told one thing and then, you know, Barry wants to turn around and start changing stuff. It, it just comes across as a little bit false. Um, but if you're asking me whether I think Steve Davis or Stephen Hendry should have a wild card for what they've done to the game, it's yeah, without question they should be entitled to wild cards and they should be entitled to play whenever they want. You know, two, you know, 13 world titles between them, six and seven, no one's got close. You've got the greatest player for me that's ever played, Ronnie, now. I mean, he's only on five. If they want to play, they should play whenever they want. It's just a shame that Barry said, come out and said no wild cards to begin with. I think uh, I think no player would have any problem with them to getting wild cards as people. It's just the fact that we've been told no wild cards, so it should be no wild cards. Another talking point tomorrow is the fact that there might there might we have to stress only might be some changes to the the way the World Championship works. Possibly there are rumours in the press room at the moment that he might tinker with the qualification process. One idea is that everybody outside the 16 would have to play three matches to qualify. It's not a case of you coming in depending on what your ranking is. Again, what are your views on that one? Because, because anything that's, that's changed with regards to the World Championship is going to be a massive talking Absolutely. point, whether people love it or hate it. Well, for me personally, that, <laughs> what you just said there is actually, uh, for me, it's ridiculous. Uh, I'll tell you for the reason why. You've got someone like Robert Milkins finished 16 in the world this year. Obviously, Ronnie won the world last year. Entitled to be in seed number one. That's fine. That's in there. But for Milkins to finish 16 in the world and have to win three matches next year if the same thing were to happen again is just absolutely absurd. That's my, that's my point. You know, it, it was hard. It was hard enough that 33 in the world had to win three matches this year. But for 17 to win three matches is, you know, it's not really on, really. OK, well, I mean, we'll be hearing from Barry mm. tomorrow whether that is the case, but that is one of the rumours that's, uh, that's circulating. Right, one of the players still yet to, uh, to play his first round match here this year is warming up in the wings. Mark Allen is up against Michael Holt tonight. Really fascinating match, that one. Mark Allen has been to the semi-finals here. He's had two uh, results in the quarter-finals. When he's in the balls, he looks really, really good. Earlier on this season, during the, uh, the Marathon 32 tournaments, which takes in 103,000 air miles we spent a little bit of time with mark allen the pistol to find out what makes him tick with regards to his love of the sport that he plays so well when he's right on song but i remember the whole match i just sat and watched him i didn't even care about the score and i didn't really know what was going on people would have probably would have asked me about the game i wouldn't have knew i was just watching him it was just like it was very nerve-wracking and but so it's just someone that I've always looked up to, so I, I'm not really surprised that I was that nervous. But I remember the next time I played him, it was in the UK Championships about a year later, and the whole match I never looked at him once. <laughs> it was still a bit awe-inspiring, so I always like looked at a point on the floor, on the table, and just avoided him when I ended up beating him 9-4. So that was like a good hurdle to get over. I remember the first live professional match I watched was Paul Hunter against Stephen Lee in the Masters. I think I was 15 at the time and me and a few friends went over to watch a few of the games. Uh, we walked in, we w missed the first frame which Stephen Lee won and the next six Hunter just didn't miss a shot and I think he would six big breaks, four centuries, chance for a 147 and I thought to myself well I've got a way to go yet if I'm going to match these boys and uh, it sort of opened my eyes to how good the players were really and how easy they make it look and you know Obviously Paul's not with us now and I didn't really know him but he was a great player and uh, he, he's really opened my eyes to snooker that day. I uh, have no idea. If I was younger I'd probably give football another go to be honest. I was like half decent footballer when I was younger but obviously I had to choose between it and snooker and probably made the wrong choice and chose snooker but there we go. I can't uh, change things but It'd be hard to say, you no, know, snooker has, has been my life for the last 16 years and 
uh, I don't really know what I would do without it as much as sometimes it frustrates the life out of me. Other times it gives you highs that you just wouldn't get anywhere else. Where do I see it going? Not in the UK anyway. Uh, UK snookers sort of dying a death really in the last four or five years. And the televised tournaments in the UK are getting less and less. It's uh, being pushed now to more to the Middle East and the Far East. I know Barry Hearn's talking about trying to branch out into like Qatar and Bahrain and places like that. And uh, It's a sorry state of affairs for UK snooker, but you know, for snooker in general, it's probably great. You know, it's becoming a global sport more than it used to be always just recognised as a UK sport, but it's so international now. And obviously Ding, he's won four of the last five ranking tournaments and he's from China. So uh, if they can't get more tournaments in China with him doing that, then <laughs> snooker's got no hope. Uh, Crucible uh, by a mile. There's no better feeling than walking out. I still get the goosebumps now. I've played there I think six or seven years in a row and still whenever you walk out to play your first match, goosebumps. There's so much history attached to it because it's such a small and cramped arena. It builds the atmosphere. There's a lot of pressure out there. And, you know, obviously the last few years haven't been too good but I have some you know, really good memories from playing there. And my first match obviously was against Ken Doherty. I think it was only my second year on tour and I managed to win that one. So. I have some good things to look back on, but it'll be a disappointment if I don't go and win that tournament one time. Just one. Uh, the dress code. I think uh, a little bit more casual would be better, I think. Uh, I think uh, it possibly puts a lot of young people off watching it, knowing we have to wear bow ties or ties and waistcoats. I think the PTCs are pretty much spot on. It still looks pretty smart with a uh, black t-shirt and black trousers, but the players are far more relaxed doing it, so maybe something along those lines. No, Tiger Woods has always been my sporting hero. No, he's uh, been obsessed about these records of Jack Nicklaus the whole way through his career, and people have been pushing him in that direction the whole way through his career, and he's handled it very, very well. Not so much now. I used to be very superstitious coming to my matches. Always would have prepared exactly the same way and wore the same clothes or the same cufflinks or listened to the same music. But there's so many tournaments on the calendar now. It'd be damaging to what you could do on the tour if you didn't have your lucky charm with you. So no, not anymore. But definitely when I was younger, I had a few things that I would have done. The, the, the highs that you get in snooker, I think, are unparalleled. Obviously I haven't experienced what footballers experience walking out onto a big pitch or the golfers you know, winning majors but you know, in, in our profession you know, there's nothing better than winning tournaments and going out there and performing well in front of maybe hundreds or possibly thousands with millions watching on TV. You know, it doesn't get much better than that. So a few thoughts there from Mark Allen, who, as we speak, is half an hour away from taking centre stage against Michael Holt. Mark, remember, a semi-finalist and a two-time quarter-finalist here. The other match about to come out live on the BBC is Ricky Walden against Kyron Wilson. Wilson started really brightly in that match, as all the debutants have this year at the Crucible, but Ricky's leading six frames to three. Those matches coming up live on BBC Two very, very shortly. A couple just to bring you up to speed with Judd Trump is beating Tom Ford 5-2 and Barry Hawkins last year's losing finalist is 5-4 up against the man who calls himself the angry farmer Dave Gilbert many more talking points to come we'll be back at about one o'clock tomorrow afternoon in the meantime thanks to my uh, guest panelist uh, Matthew Selt Matthew always good to hear your thoughts Pleasure let's uh, hang around tomorrow and see what happens as a result of the uh, Barry uh, the Barry press conference many many things to come out of that uh, we're sure thanks very much for now that wraps things up on day four we'll see you on day five watch out Mark Allen Michael Holt the pistol against the hitman coming live on the BBC in about half an hour's time in the meantime bye bye <laughs>